Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Emily's real second lecture um, in the homotopy type theory track for the hottest summer school 2022. Uh, great, wonderful, thanks so much. I'm excited to be back. Uh, let me set up my screen share. So uh, there are lecture notes on the summer school uh, website. Somebody can drop the link for that in the chat. Um, I'll give a mild update to them after the lecture, but they're uh, pretty close right now. Okay, and so what we're gonna talk about today are uh, propositions, which is a word that we've been using informally uh, for quite a while now. I'm going to give a formal definition today. In fact, several equivalent, logically equivalent, at least formal definitions. And uh, then we'll understand that these propositions live together with the uh, contractible types and something that might feel somewhat intuitive, this concept of a set uh, in this uh, general hierarchy of what are called truncation levels. So, um, a way to understand what we're really talking about are these general truncation levels, but there are some special cases that are especially important, namely the contractible types and the propositions and the sets. But um, before I get to any of that, I want to give a little bit of a preview of coming attractions by discussing some uh, spaces that you can build, spaces that uh, you can build. So there, I want, there's two different ways that you could think about what I'm about to say. So one is if you've had some acquaintance with uh, point set topology, or um, which uh, gives an abstract mathematical definition of a topological space, you can think about spaces in that sense. So I'm, I'm using uh, spaces in sort of the traditional mathematical way. Um, but we've also seen in the AGDA uh, track of this lecture series, something called higher inductive types, which is a way um, which uh, Dan illustrated can be used to build certain uh, spaces uh, like the circle by attaching some sort of cells. And if that's a, a better intuition for you on what a space is, both of those perspectives will work equally well. Okay, so let's see some examples of some spaces. Um, and, and maybe I'll lean a little bit more in the type theoretic language or well, I'll kind of go back and forth. So you can imagine having a space with just a single point. So uh, as a type, we've been calling that the unit type. So I'll just write one for it. So this is something that you would build by freely adding a point. Or you, know, you could freely add two points. Uh, so that's uh, the type of Booleans, but maybe I'll kind of write it this way. So this is a space that you've built by freely adding two points. So you could freely add, you know, um, some finite numbers worth of points, you just iterate this operation. Um, there's a similar, you could freely add no points. That's uh, something we've been thinking about as the initial type. And so these are some sort of simple spaces. Um, now to build a kind of higher dimensional space, um, there's this idea of a higher inductive type. Uh, we saw S1. And this can be understood as a space that's built by freely adding, so I'll, I'll draw a little cartoon here. It's a space that can be built um, by uh, freely adding a point and then freely adding a loop that connects from that point to itself. And um, so that's that's some space that has, you know, maybe a bit of a higher dimension because we have this non-trivial path that we put in. And uh, you can um, then imagine adding even higher uh, dimensional information. So uh, I think Dan briefly mentioned the two-dimensional analog of the sphere, um, which can be understood by freely adding a point. And then uh, we're not going to freely add any non-trivial paths, but there is a path that's uh, guaranteed once you freely added a point. It's the constant path or this reflexivity proof. And then you could freely add a path between paths connecting this reflexivity proof with itself. So topologically, you would describe that as attaching a two-dimensional path as opposed to a one-dimensional path, which you can think about as a square, where I'm identifying all of the edges of the square to this constant path, or in other words, just to that point. And so what that looks like is you're, you sort of have this uh, sheet that you're kind of gluing on to your point, but you're only along the boundary, so not, not including any of the points in the interior. And so that creates a little bubble, or in other words, a, a two-dimensional sphere, a sphere as traditionally understood. And uh, there are higher dimensional analogs of this construction as well. So I could um, uh, 
you know, th th three, and now the pictures are going to get worse. Maybe I'll, I won't even bother, <laughs> but you could freely attach a three-dimensional path between the constant thing between the constant thing uh, or a four dimensional path or five dimensional path. And these would construct the spheres for you in any dimension. Um, so there are other spaces that are a little lower dimensional that I could uh, maybe a little bit easier to visualize. Um, so there's this thing that's called the torus that has uh, come up as well. And a way to understand this is this space can be built by starting with a point and then uh, freely attaching two different paths. And when I say freely, that means they're necessarily gonna be distinct. So one of them is uh, a loop again from that point to itself. And then the other is a loop, which I'm gonna draw somewhere else. And to have this visualization, um, this the picture I've drawn so far kind of looks like a figure eight, but if you have the figure eight in your head, it would be better if you uh, rotated one of the two loops by 90 degrees. So one's in kind of one plane, the other is in some sort of perpendicular plane. And what I'm going to do now is attach a, a single uh, two dimensional uh, path between paths onto, or, or sort of a two dimensional loop, a sort of surface along its boundary in this, in a, in a very particular way. And if I, if I did this in a different way, I would get a different space. Um, so, uh, here, um, a, you know, space between paths, a two-dimensional path between paths is something like a piece of paper. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to glue again the boundary of this piece of paper onto the space that I've built already. So the, uh, the boundary is, is nicely divided for me into these four different sections. And I'm going to identify each of these four sections with one of the paths that I have in the space that I've built already. And the way that I'm going to do this is maybe it would be helpful at this stage to give my paths names. I'll call them A and B. And then as I traverse the boundary of this sheet of paper, I'm going to uh, start by identifying the first edge with the loop A. So remember, A is kind of a, a loop like this, so that involves sort of folding it together and sort of gluing it on to wherever it was. Then I'm going to attach the second edge to the loop B, so that's going to glue this around to the other thing. So I have kind of these two pieces sort of glued in so far. Then I'm going to attach the third edge. I'm, so I'm still traversing the boundary of the um, piece of paper in a uh, consistent orientation. I'm going to attach the third edge back to the loop A, but in the reversed direction, so to the inverse of that. And then the final edge B to the loop B in the inverse direction. And there's sort of a better way to do this physically, which is to sort of attach the two opposing loops uh, sides together, this is B and that's B inverse, and then attach these two opposing sides together, that's A and that's A inverse. And I'm, as I'm sure you can see very clearly, <laughs> this produces a sort of familiar kind of donut looking space, which is this mathematical thing called the torus. So what I've, I've achieved is I've kind of glued in uh, this cylindrical thing on the frame that was constructed by that A and B. So this is sort of a, a two dimensional space. Uh, and there's no reason, you know, all of these things I've, I've glued together finitely many cells, but there's uh, no reason to necessarily stop at a finite level. So um, there is uh, spaces called uh, sort of infinite dimensional real projective space or infinite dimensional complex projective space uh, that can be understood in various different ways. But um, these can be formed by uh, gluing in infinitely many of these cells in sort of infinite uh, dimensions um, along particular um, and in a particular way, like we described a particular gluing to construct the torus. Okay, so there's, um, I've, I've been describing kind of a naive hierarchy of these uh, spaces by dimension today, but the reason I want to point this out is that uh, in this uh, hierarchy corresponding to the truncation levels, um, we're going to break them up in a way that's perhaps a little bit non-intuitive. Um, and uh, this reflects uh, language that algebraic topologists are already using. So, um, so our notion of a truncation level is going to correspond to something that existed in mathematics, but I, I think it's a little bit uh, confusing if you haven't studied this area. So firstly, um, these uh, pipes or spaces that we built by just gluing in points, uh, there's points we can think of as being sort of zero dimensional, and these will eventually all be called zero types. Uh, now, um, once you glue in some sort of non-trivial identification or something non, uh, 
sort of non-trivial higher bit of data. You're uh, no longer in the world of zero types. You're going to be in the world of one types. Uh, but this world of one types actually includes uh, more things than you might think. So it includes the, the circle that's sort of a prototypical one type. But even though these spaces, this torus and this infinite real dimensional perspective space were built by gluing in even higher dimensional things, there's a sense that we'll make precise later on that these are all one types as well. So somehow this uh, these higher cells are uh, trivial in a sense. Um, and then uh, there's no reason to stop at zero and one. So there's um, some sort of uh, non-trivial homotopical information up to level two, but no higher. That includes this complex projective space. And there's similarly a notion of three type or four type or n type for any uh, finite natural number n. And interestingly, uh, uh, those n types do not include any of these higher dimensional spheres. So, I mean, you, you might think that S2 is a two type because there's a two in the name and S3 would be a three type and S4 would be a four type, but that's actually not the case at all. These are all sort of uh, untruncated homotopy types, meaning that they have interesting uh, homotopical information in all dimensions. Um, so for those in the know, this has to go with the, it has to do with the non-trivial uh, higher homotopy groups of spheres, which we could talk about more at some other stage. And one other thing that we're going to see is uh, a little bit of differentiation going down. So within these zero types, we'll actually have a, a smaller level, um, which will be the minus one types, minus one uh, types and uh, an even smaller level, which will be the minus two types, which will contain this uh, single point space, but not the empty space. Um, so that's a preview of coming attractions. Uh, but let me say a little tiny bit about what is this about? Uh, so what is this hierarchy about? From a, from a geometric point of view, I'll give the real definition uh, momentarily. What is this uh, hierarchy about? Uh, and a way to think about it is it concerns the complexity of the iterated identity types. Uh, so it concerns the, now I'm going to speak in a type theoretic language, the iterated identity types. So let's, uh, let me just remind you what I mean by that. So if I have any type A, then um, if given any two terms of type A, I could form the identity type, uh, which whose terms would be identifications between them. So here X and Y have to be terms of type A for that to make sense. And then if I had two terms P and Q belonging to this type, I could form another identity type uh, whose terms would then be identifications between P and Q, which are themselves identifications between X and Y, which are themselves terms of type A. And I could iterate if I had two such identifications, say an alpha and a beta, and I could look for identifications between them where alpha and beta now are both identifications between P and Q, which are themselves identifications between X and Y, which are terms of type A and so on. So this is what I mean by these iterated identity types. So the formation rule for identity types allows us to iterate in this sense. And we have this intuition coming from topology or geometry that the, the data gets higher dimensional as we go up. Um, so let's think about an example. So uh, for the natural numbers, um, at this first level, we have identity types like the type three is equal to four. Um, so uh, determine this would be a proof that three is equal to four. Uh, so let's let's try and iterate. So we might think, you know, at sort of the next level, we would have an identity type P equals Q, where those are both proofs, that three is equal to four, where those are the two natural numbers. Um, except three doesn't actually equal four. <laughs> so so um, there are no terms P and Q. And to form this identity type, I would need to have a term P and a term Q that gives an identification between three and four. So, um, you know, this type really uh, doesn't exist. And so it'd be better if I uh, change this. Um, I'm going to replace this three by, say, two plus two equals four. I mean, there are... Uh, terms that identify two plus two and four. So, um, so now I'm a little bit happier. Uh, um, but uh, um, one thing that uh, we'll see is uh, that this is the kind of last stage where there's, or, or really maybe this stage is the last stage where there's interesting in, information. So 
um, one of the things that, uh, in fact, you know a proof of, but I'll, it would take a few steps. So maybe this is a puzzle for you to think about until we return to this. Um, uh, there's a, essentially a unique proof. Uh, um, so th this type here is, al is always trivial in the sense that it's uh, inhabited, but uniquely inhabited. It's a, it's a contractible type. So this sort of hierarchy stops here and there's kind of nothing interesting further on. So that's the sense in which uh, um, we have some information about the, the level of complexity in the iterated identity types in the natural numbers. Um, so just to mention one more example. So uh, S1 is this type. Uh, it has its uh, term base. So we have an identity type here of identifications between base and base. We could have identity types here like uh, loop, which was the freely attached uh, path from base to base equals REFL. So this is an uh, kind of interesting iterated identity type. These again are both paths from base to base within the circle S1. And now I could imagine, uh, you know, again, having some sort of alpha equals beta where uh, um, loop is equal to REFL, but in, in fact, loop is sort of not equal to REFL. So it'd be better to consider, you know, identifications between loop and loop and S1. And a thing that will, uh, can be proven about S1, though that's not something that we'll prove today, is that this uh, stops here as well. Um, so this type uh, turns out to be a contractible type and not just the specific one. If I had taken different, uh, if I'd taken REFL instead of loop or loop squared instead of loop, um, those types would also be contractible. And so that's something about this hierarchy of iterated identity types. Okay, so all of that is really just a preview um, of uh, kind of this full complexity of the hierarchy. Um, but what I want to transition to now is uh, to talk about um, the first interesting level that we haven't uh, seen yet. And we'll explain later on how this level fits into this hierarchy, but uh, this is just a wonderfully rich subject in and of its own. And so I'm gonna tell you something about propositions uh, starting from the definition. So, um, and the definition is maybe a little bit surprising, uh, but I'm just gonna go right in and then we can start to reason about it. So a proposition is a, is a type of types. So it's a, a, some types will be propositions and some types will not be propositions. Uh, so a type A is called a proposition. Uh, this should be thought of as like a predicate odd types. It's a class of types. So a type is a proposition. If all of its identity types are contractible, identity types, are contractible. Okay, and so to make sense of this, uh, let me actually stop, uh, pause, and review very briefly the notion of contractibility, uh, which we'll need centrally to go on. So recall uh, a type A is contractible uh, if it has a unique element in, uh, so this is kind of an informal way of speaking it, but a, a unique element in the way that we would express that in type theory, a unique element. And what I mean by that is, uh, so how would you prove this? I mean, firstly, you would look for an element of type A, a term of type A. So um, I'm asking with the sigma type for there to exist some term of type A. And then if I happen to stumble across another term of type A, say an X of type A, then uh, I'm going to ask for an identification between those two. So this is the sense of uniqueness I meant. Really what I mean is contractibility. So type is contractible if firstly you can exhibit a term. Um, sometimes it's informally called the center of contraction. And then moreover, find a homotopy. So the term in this second type can be interpreted as a homotopy from the constant function at the center of contraction to the identity function. Or in other words, just the path connecting any other term X of type A to this center. So this whole thing that I've uh, formed right here, uh, this sigma of this pi is the name of a type. And because we're gonna use it a lot, I'm going to uh, abbreviate it. So is contra A, 
is the name of this type. Um, this is the type, a term in which would witness the contractibility of A. And similarly, we can uh, define a type is prop A, which is asking whether or not A is a proposition. So what was the definition? It said, if all of its identity types are contractible, so the identity types of a type are parameterized over pairs of terms. So I'm gonna form a pi. So the pi over X, Y, and A says for all X, Y, and A, then I'm asking whether these identity types are propositions. Okay, so this is the notion of proposition in homotopy type theory. It's a type whose identity types are propositions. Uh, let's see some examples. So uh, the first example is uh, the unit type is contractible, or sorry, the unit type is a proposition. Unit type one is a proposition. Uh, and this is something that you've proven already uh, because its identity types are all contractible. So for the unit type, uh, you know, you could prove this by induction on the constructor star. Um, by induction, it would suffice to just prove that star equals star is contractible. And you can be very explicit about exhibiting all of this data. It's natural to use the reflexivity term as the center of contraction. And then uh, this contracting homotopy can also be defined uh, by path induction by, or I guess not by path induction, but uh, using reflexivity. Right. I guess it is, but well, this is an exercise that you've solved already, so I don't have to explain how to solve it. Um, so more generally, uh, any contractible type, any uh, contractible type uh, is a proposition. And um, a way that you might understand this, um, so you could also just reason di directly from the definition of contractibility to show that that type a proposition. Uh, I think that argument's a little bit subtle. It's, uh, it always takes me a little bit of time to reconstruct it. But an, another way to kind of package this idea is, um, you know, one thing we know about contractible types is that they are equivalent to the unit type. And uh, it follows then that their identity types are equivalent to the identity types of the unit type. And since we've shown that the identity types of the unit type are contractible, um, it will follow that the identity types of any contractible type are contractible. And so that's a sense in which uh, contractible types are propositions. Um, and then there's one more example uh, that's definitely worth mentioning, which is that the empty type is a proposition. So this is the free type on no constructors. So to prove this, uh, what I need to prove is that is prop empty holds. And let's recall the definition. This is the type that asks for any pair of terms x, y in uh, the empty type. I need to show that the identity type between them is contractible. x equals y as terms of the empty type. Uh, so what do I need to do? So I want to inhabit this type family. So I'm looking to map out, this is a dependent function type. I need to map out of two terms of the identity type. Um, but the identity type as an inductive type has an induction principle or has an elimination rule. And in general, what these elimination rules say is that uh, to construct a dependent function out of your inductive type, it suffices to specify an image of all of the constructors. Uh, but the identity type doesn't have any constructors. So, so in this case, you get a dependent function for free doing no work at all. And uh, we have a name for that dependent function. Um, does anyone want to drop that name in the chat? So, um, so for the folks who are here in person, uh, let's use the chat to the host and panelists or just chat just to me. Yeah, so I'm looking for a name of... Uh, I mean, I guess I'm just asking you about what is your convention for this thing? So maybe this is an ill-posed question, um, but, uh, but a name that we've been using and we've encountered this at a few places in the past is something called X falso. Um, but if you have a preferred name, I've actually I've seen uh, five or six different suggestions. So that's really wonderful. Um, great, but uh, 
Um, right, so, so mapping out of the empty type comes for free. There's this term x falso, which would inhabit any dependent function type out of the identity type. Um, and so um, and that in case is giving, in this specific instance, is giving a proof that this type is a proposition, kind of a vacuous proof. Um, but the definition is, is definitely intended to admit this as a proposition. OK, so now that we've seen some examples, uh, let's prove some facts about the propositions. and. The first one uh, is that there's several different logically equivalent ways to give this definition. And I think this is super cool and it's just fun to know about them. So for a type A, the following are logically equivalent. Uh, following are logically equivalent. So these are all different ways to think about propositions. Um, once more, in fact, all of the following will be equivalent, not just logically equivalent, but I can't quite prove that today. So I'm uh, gonna state it like this. So the first thing is that A is a proposition, which I'll remind you is this assertion that for all uh, X, Y of type A, the identity type between X and Y is contractible. Okay, so that was the, the original definition. The second is that any two terms of type A can be identified. Any two terms of type A can be identified. And what this means is that again, for any uh, terms X, Y of type A, uh, I can find a path between them, an identification. So rather than a proof of contractibility, it, it suffices, in fact, to just identify them. And this is very cool. And this is also, um, I mean, it's just a useful way to think about propositions. It's uh, often what you need to know if you're using a hypothesis that something is a proposition. OK, so the third equivalent definition is that uh, A is contractible uh, once it's inhabited, once it's inhabited. And so what I mean by this, um, you know, maybe my grammar here is a little bit confusing, but what I, probably has two Ts. Uh, what I mean by this is as follows, is that if A holds, so if I have a term of type A, then from the data of that term, I could prove that A is contractible. Okay, so it's interesting to think about uh, what this, statement is asserting in the case of an identity type, or sorry, the, the empty type, which is one of our um, propositions. Um, this would say that empty type implies that the empty type is contractible. Uh, in this case, the empty type is not contractible, but um, the empty type implies anything. So, you know, so this, this full type here is inhabited, even though is contractible, the empty type is not inhabited. Okay. And then finally, uh, another a final way to think about it is that the map, uh, which I'm, is constant at the constructor star from A to the unit type is an embedding. So, to, so, th so this, this map again is the, is the map that would send any term of type A to the constructor star, which is the name of our special term in, inside the unit type. Um, so if this map is an equivalence that would assert that A is a contractible type, but to ask that it's an embedding, meaning that on its application on identity types is an equivalence, turns out to be a way to assert that A is a proposition. OK, so let's uh, prove this logical equivalence. And I'm going to prove it by constructing functions from 1 to 2, and then from 2 to 3, and then from 3 to 4, and then from 4 back to 1. So let's, let's do all of that. So my first goal is to show that if A is a proposition, so assuming I have a term of this type, uh, then any two terms of type A can be identified. So for any X, Y in A, I have X is equal to Y. Okay. Uh, well, and let's just, you know, as we're getting used to these notions, let me remind you what it means to say that uh, 
this identity type is contractible. What that means is that there exists, so using the definition of contractibility, which is just off the screen, so there exists a term of the identity type that's like our center of contraction. And then for any other term in the identity type, I have an identification between these two, which is in this case is going to be one of these paths between paths, because those are both already paths from X to Y and A. Okay, so if I have something here, then I need to get something here. So let's suppose that I do have a term of this type. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll call it alpha. So what I'd like is a term of this type. So by the introduction rule for dependent function types that says for any X, for any Y, I need to produce then a path from X to Y. But that's part of the data that's in this proof alpha. So if I take alpha and apply it to X and Y and then take its first projection, PR1, alpha of x, y. This alpha of x, y is a proof actually that that identity type is contractible. And part of the data of that is the center of contraction, which gives us the identification. So this, this step is uh, pretty straightforward. I can just extract a term in this type directly from a term in that type. Great. So let's uh, move on. So now I'm going to assume that I have a term of this type. So I have an identification between uh, any two terms of type A. And what I want to construct from that is a proof that uh, A implies is contractible A, uh, which I think for convenience, I'll write out this definition again. So for all C and A, uh, so there exists some C and A, and then there exists for all X and A, C is equal to X. OK, so let's assume now that I have a term of this type. Uh, maybe I'll call it P. So P is a dependent function that for any X and Y would give us an identification between X and Y. And then I want to construct a term of this type. So I get to pick up an A, which is a term of type A. And now I need to use this information of this P and this A to give a proof that uh, A, the type A is contractible. So I need a term of this sigma type. So its first component, I need a, a term of type A, and I have one. I have this little a. And now I'm looking for an identification for any x and a between my a and x. But I can extract this data out of this p back here. So p is a dependent function that takes in two arguments. But I just give a as its first argument. Uh, now that takes in the second argument and would give an identification for me to that. So this p is giving us. Well, P of A really is giving us a contracting homotopy at my term A. Um, so uh, once again, this wasn't so bad. I just kind of directly had the data that I needed. OK, so now this is going to start to get a little bit more interesting. So for 3 implies 4, I'm supposed to uh, use a proof that A implies uh, that A is contractible. And then conclude from that that uh, this constant function is an embedding. And so what that means is that for all x, y of type A, uh, the application of this constant function is an equivalence. So, uh, so what's this application on the constant function at star? That's going to be a function from the identity type between x and y and type A uh, to the identity type from star to star inside the unit type. OK, so I'm trying to conclude that this is equivalence from a proof that A implies the contractibility of A. So OK, how are we going to do this? So um, well, before I try and inhabit this type, I'm actually going to inhabit a different type. And then I'll, I'll explain at the end how uh, this second type is helpful. So I'm going to. Uh, inhabit the type, which is that A implies this conclusion. And uh, sorry, sorry, using, um, I'm going to give myself a term. Uh, so I'm going to give myself a term C inside here. So C is a proof that A implies the contractibility of A. And now I'm going to inhabit this type. So how do I do that? Um, so. Uh, so here I'm allowed to give myself a term of type A, and I'm looking for proof that for all 
x, y, uh, uh, I have this equivalence, but um, so this, in this case, it would be pretty complicated to write out this term. So I'm just going to write kind of a thought bubble and explain the idea. So using my term A and my proof C that A implies that A is contractible, I have C of A, which is a proof of the contractibility of A. And I'm going to use this uh, to uh, conclude or is, I guess, something that I know. So once I know that A is contractible, I can conclude that its identity types are contractible, and thus they're equivalent to uh, the identity types in the unit type, which are also contractible, equivalent to uh, the identity types between the constructor inside the unit type. So because, I, in this situation, I'm working under the hypothesis that A is known to be a contractible type. Here, it turns out I'm looking for an equivalence between two contractible types, and that just is, is automatic from the contractibility of the domain and the codomain. So, so if I granted myself this information of this C and this A, so A is a term of type A, C is a proof that A implies that A is contractible, I can use the contractibility to conclude that this constant map is an embedding. So all of this packaged together um, gives me a term inside this type. And what I really wanted was a term inside this uh, type up at the top. So let's kind of complete our goal now. So what I was hoping for is a proof that uh, A implies is contractible. A implies that the uh, constant function is an embedding. And so here I'm looking for, uh, again, a dependent function. So that would say for any x and y of type A, I need a proof uh, of this. But uh, once I apply my f, which was the term that I constructed above, I could pick either x or y. Uh, and then I guess also to x and y. Um, that will give me what I want. So this, this is kind of, this feels like a little bit of a swindle somehow. Um, but uh, because I'm trying to inhabit a dependent function type, at some point I get to give myself terms of type A, which I can then feed in to this implication that I proved above. Um, and uh, that gives you that gives you what you need. Um, so that's sort of a very cool uh, trick somehow. Okay, so there's one step left, which is to prove that uh, if my constant function is an embedding, uh, then uh, A is uh, a proposition. So let me do that. So for the final step, uh, I assume this, and I'm going, and I want to conclude that A is a proposition. So for all uh, x, y of type A, the identity type between x and y is contractible. Um, but in this case, my proof that uh, this constant function is an embedding uh, provides, so this alpha here, uh, again, I'm gonna just explain the idea rather than try and write a term. Um, so alpha provides an equivalence, provides an equivalence between um, the identity type, of an arbitrary identity type in type A and this identity type in the unit type. And we know that these identity types in the unit types are contractible. So these identity types are contractible, which is what I wanted to show. These identity types in A are contractible. So that is the end of the proof. And I'll uh, go up to the statement. So we have four logically equivalent ways of thinking about what makes a type a proposition. So the original definition is that its identity types are contractible, but it suffices in fact to just identify any two terms in that proposition, or um, we can use the fact that uh, contractible types or propositions are contractible once they're inhabited or they're things that embed into the unit type. Um, so that's very cool. Okay.
So this was all about the definition of being a proposition, but um, we'd like to prove some facts about the propositions as well, um, which will allow us uh, to use the notion. And in fact, um, I mean, we've been using a whole bunch of facts that we know about contractible types already, you know, in the proof just given now. So here um, in this last step of the argument, for instance, I use the fact that once a type is equivalent to a contractible type, then it itself is a contractible type. And the same thing is true for the propositions. So let's prove that next. So this lemma will say that if uh, a is equivalent to B, so A and B are types, if A is equivalent to B, then uh, A is a proposition if and only if B is a proposition. So I can express that like this, is prop A holds if and only if, uh, is prop B holds. This uh, biconditional is, uh, this is the type which, uh, is a pair comprised of an implication or a function from is prop A to is prop B and one in the other direction. And is prop B implies is prop A. Okay, so under the hypothesis that A and B are equivalent, I can conclude that one is a proposition if and only if the other is a proposition. So let's prove this. So I'm gonna suppose that uh, I have an equivalence between uh, a and B, and I'm going to use a, a common abusive notation, and I'm going to write uh, E uh, for that equivalence. So technically, uh, this type that I've written here with the equivalence symbol is a sigma type, and this is the first projection of a, a term in that sigma type, but it's common to just uh, abuse notation and write uh, the same name for the function part of the equivalence. Okay, so one thing we know about equivalences uh, is that uh, if I have an equivalence between types, uh, then I get an equivalence that application of that equivalence defines an equivalence between their identity types. So I know um, that for all uh, terms x, y of type A, um, I have this application of E, which is a function from the identity type in A to the corresponding identity type in B. And I know that this function is an equivalence. So this is a fact about equivalences. So uh, if uh, B is a proposition, so if is prop B holds, then uh, all of its identity types are contractible. And in particular, for all X, Y, and A, uh, the identity type between EX, sorry, that's a typo, that should be EY, the identity type between EX and EY in B, this is one of the identity types in B, so this type would be contractible. So being a proposition means all of the identity types are contractible, and some particular those that are in the image of this E are contractible. Um, but because of this equivalence and the fact that I mentioned above that contractible types are invariant under equivalence, if you're equivalent to a contractible type, you're yourself contractible. Um, thus, uh, the identity type in A, which is equivalent to this one. So we know again that this is equivalent to this one uh, is contractible as well. Contractible as well. So what this does, uh, so this proves an implication that is prop B implies is prop A. Now I need to also prove the inverse implication or the, the uh, converse implication that uh, if that is prop A applies is prop B, but uh, for the converse, I can use a general fact about equivalences that if A and B are equivalent as types, then B and A are equivalent as types. So there's a symmetry of equivalence. In other words, I can use an inverse equivalence to this function E and then run the same argument again to conclude that uh, if A is a proposition, then B is a proposition as well. 
Um, so that is uh, um, great. Okay, so um, one final fact about the propositions I want to prove is as follows. So if uh, P and Q are propositions, then uh, an equivalence between P and Q is types, or maybe I'll say it like this, then P and Q are equivalent as types if and only if P and Q are logically equivalent. So I've been alluding to this uh, fact at a few stages already. Um, so a logical equivalence between propositions is the same as a genuine equivalence between those types. That's uh, what's being asserted here. So you can promote a logical equivalence between propositions to an equivalence. Um, and uh, again, this isn't so hard. So, uh, so um, for any types, regardless of uh, whether or not they're propositions, having an equivalence between those types would provide a logical equivalence. The data of an equivalence includes the implications in both directions and then some homotopies. So, um, so this implication holds in complete generality. Um, so if uh, P and Q are propositions, we can prove the converse. Our propositions uh, we can prove the converse. So we can prove, we can promote a logical equivalence to a genuine equivalence. So if P and Q are propositions and I have a logical equivalence, in other words, I have an implication, a proof F that P implies Q and a proof G that Q implies P, then uh, to give a homotopy, I'm sorry, to give an equivalence, then to uh, prove that uh, P is equivalent to Q. I require homotopies. So in general, uh, you don't need uh, to use the same left and right inverse, but it's no problem to. So for instance, I would need a homotopy like this, which, uh, well, in a homotopy the other way, and I'll remind you that these are uh, dependent function types. So this would take a term X of type Q and produce an identification between F of G of X and X, and also take a term uh, Y of type P and produce an identification between G and F of Y and Y. But one of the things that I know about propositions is in a proposition, any two terms can be identified, um, but uh, any, pair of terms in a proposition can be identified. So uh, constructing homotopies is no problem. There's, it's, it comes for free. And in fact, there's a sense in which it's unique using the contractibility. Uh, so there's, there's really sort of, this, these types are inhabited and then there's uh, no data there. Um, any pair of types in a proposition can be identified. Any pair of terms in a proposition can be identified. Okay, so it will turn out we can't. I'm, I keep getting in trouble because there's, there's. We're going to know a whole lot more about propositions next time once I introduce one other axiom. Um, but, uh, but certainly from the definition of a proposition, I, I can construct terms in these types, which is all I need to do right now. Great. Okay, so that's it for the propositions, and now I want to start moving up the hierarchy. Uh, so, and introduce uh, some types that are called sets. So uh, I'll just give the definition. So a type uh, A is a set uh, if its identity types are propositions. So there's a definition of this predicate on types is set, similar to the predicate is prop. And it looks uh, quite similar in a way that's suggestive of generalization, which we'll discuss momentarily. Um, but here's the definition. So um, 
for any, if I look at an arbitrary identity type. So if I look for an arbitrary pair of terms of type A, then this identity type is a proposition. That's what characterizes the sets. Uh, and we have an example. So for uh, the natural numbers, one of the things that we've proven is that the identity type between a pair of natural numbers is equivalent to this observational equality type that we defined by induction. So this was a double induction over both N and N. So by this double induction, you can show that for any M and N in N, uh, this observational equality type is a proposition. Uh, why is that? Well, um, when we induct, we uh, get the base cases where we define this to either be the unit type or the empty type or a previous type in this hierarchy. And we've shown that the unit type and the empty type are both propositions. So this really does just follow by induction. But by the lemma we've proven above, by uh, the invariance of propositions under equivalence, variance of propositions under equivalence. So once a type is equivalent to a proposition, it itself is a proposition under equivalence. It follows, but using this observational quality uh, um, that the identity types in the natural numbers are themselves propositions. So thus the conclusion is that the natural numbers is a set. So that's super cool. Um, and uh, there are other examples of sets that can be proven by sort of a similar uh, general strategy. So for instance, uh, the, the Booleans, which you uh, did some exercises on in Agda, uh, you have enough information to conclude that those are sets as well. Uh, so there's a cool, and a, there's another sort of abstract way to think about sets, a logically equivalent way to think about sets. Uh, so for a type, a, and this will connect with something that uh, has been appearing in the Agda files that I think was perhaps a little bit mysterious. Uh, so for type A, the following are logically equivalent. Okay, the first statement is that A is a set. And the second statement is that A satisfies something called axiom K satisfies axiom K. So this is a, a, a default that's built into Agda that we're turning off with that flag without K that appears at the top of the, uh, the Agda files. And, and I can think of, so what axiom K of a type A asserts is the following. It says for any term X of type A, and for any self-identification, so P is a identification of X with itself, then uh, um, which way do I want this to go? I think it doesn't really matter. Let me say P is equal to REFL of X. Okay, so uh, axiom K is asserting that uh, there are no, that any identification of X with itself is itself reflexivity. Um, okay. So uh, this again is one of those logical equivalences where one direction is pretty clear and what's interesting is the other direction. So if I had that A is a set, so is set A uh, is asserting, uh, you know, that for all XY type A, for all PQ, identifications between X and Y. Um, really, it's asserting the contractibility of uh, this identity type between P and Q, but on account of the logical equivalences that we've discussed above, I could uh, just think about having an identification between P and Q. And so this is, axiom K is clearly a special case of that. So that's the proof that one implies two, um, but let's quickly prove that two implies one. So let's assume I have a term K that for any X in A and for any self-identification P from X to X constructs an identification between P and reflexivity. 
And let's now suppose that I'm given an arbitrary pair of terms, x, y of type A, and an arbitrary pair of paths, P, Q, uh, from x to y. I want to show that uh, P can be identified with Q. And we'll get this by composing a path of identifications. So I could start from my P. So I can prove that P is identifiable with its uh, concatenation with reflexivity. This is using, uh, is it's the right unit law or the left unit law? I guess I'm going to call it right unit. Uh, now, uh, uh, so using um, so using axiom K, let me swap axiom K around because it doesn't actually matter. Uh, um, so I'm going to identify reflexivity with P just for aesthetics. So using axiom K, I can identify, uh, so Q, P, I'm sorry, what am I trying to do? I'm, uh, you know what, I think, uh, I think I actually want to keep it the way I had it originally. I'm just going to do that. Okay, so using uh, an inverse law, I can uh, identify reflexivity with uh, Q inverse Q. Um, this is really a whiskered version of that homotopy. Then using my associativity, uh, this triple composite is equally P, Q inverse, concatenated with Q. And now I can use uh, axiom K, so my homotopy K, uh, at the special case of X and using the loop P, Q inverse. So that's going to be an identification between this loop P concatenated with Q inverse and reflexivity at X. And uh, then I use my other unit law, my left unit law, to identify that Q. So axiom K is really just asserting that all loops are trivial, but it follows then that any paths are trivial by this uh, argument here. Cool. OK, so there's a lot more that's interesting to say about sets. And uh, I've written a little bit of it in, into the lecture notes, but a, Better reference, of course, is Egbert's book. Um, in particular, uh, a thing that you can prove is that any type with decidable equality is a set, which gives another sort of general strategy for showing that a type is a set. Um, but I'm going to leave that for the reading so that uh, we can go now uh, to the general truncation levels. General truncation levels. And what I want to start by observing is that we, the definitions that we've presented so far uh, fit into a pattern. And um, now we're going to make that pattern very explicit. So, so far we have defined the following uh, kind of predicates on types. So we've uh, indicated that a type is contractible uh, just when you know, it has some center of contraction and for any other term of that type, can be identified with the center of contraction. We've then defined uh, a type to be a proposition just when all of its identity types are contractible. And then we've defined a type to be a set just when all of its identity types are propositions. And uh, there's an evident way to continue I could define, consider the requirement that uh, says that all of the identity types in my type are sets, uh, but now I need a name for this. <laughs> and that's uh, kind of what's happening with this, this hierarchy. So um, there's this idea that sets somehow are zero dimensional. And so uh, this level are gonna be called the zero types levels zero. And uh, that will give us a name for this next level, which will be the one types. 
So we'll define is one a type, or actually I'll use slightly different language for that, um, be uh, this condition here. But now, I mean, there's no need, I mean, just because it's conventional to sort of stop at zero doesn't mean you have to, you could continue on my, uh, you could continue on downwards. So sort of by analogy, we're gonna call the propositions, the negative one types and the contractible types, the negative two types and start our counting at negative two. So before I introduce the general truncation levels, I need to tell you what we're going to count by. So I'm gonna introduce an inductive type that re-index, essentially just re-indexes the natural numbers to start at minus two rather than at zero. Um, so, uh, so I'm gonna let T, T for the type of truncation levels, maybe I'll write that down, the type of truncation levels uh, be the type uh, freely generated by And what I'm going to repeat here is the definition of the natural numbers, but I'm going to introduce different notations. So uh, its base thing will be something called minus two. And its uh, successor will be called successor, but I'm, I'll give it a subscript because this is a function from t to t rather than a function from n to n. So this is this. Uh, Definition is uh, transparently equivalent to the natural numbers because I've defined it in exactly the same way using different notation. But I want to think about its relationship with the natural numbers in a different way. So uh, there is an inclusion, which I'll call just i, I suppose, from the natural numbers to t defined by. So by induction on the natural numbers, I'm going to say this is the thing that sends the natural number zero to the element of t that corresponds to zero. And what is that? Oh, sorry. I have a, I just noticed in the chat that there's a pretty bad typo here that I'm going to go ahead and uh, correct for the record. Uh, so if, yeah, feel free to interrupt me if uh, there are things like that. That definition was totally wrong, so sorry about that. Um, OK, so uh, I, I would like this 0 to correspond to the 0, so not to minus 2. This is not the order isomorphism, but this is the inclusion of the natural numbers as the elements that uh, really correspond to that. So this is the successor of the successor of uh, minus two, and then I'm gonna define the inclusion of the successor in the natural number sense of some n to be uh, the successor in the truncation level sense of the inclusion of that n. And subject to this inclusion, so this is the way that we're gonna identify natural numbers with truncation levels. So this uh, lets us, abuse notation and write uh, things like minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, et cetera, k, k plus one for terms of type t. So I'm not gonna be so fussy with the notation anymore. I mean, t is just the natural level so being at minus two. Okay, great. So now I'm gonna define the truncation levels and uh, and here's the definition. So um, yeah, what's going on here? So what we've seen in this sort of pattern is that for a truncation level, so for a number like minus two, minus one, zero, one, et cetera. And then for a type A, I have this type that expresses the fact, you know, sort of, I don't know, some fact about its identity types. So um, what I'm gonna define is something that's called is truncated. So is trunk for is truncated, which will take as an argument, a truncation level, and then a type, and then return a type. 
I'm going to define this by induction over T, which is basically like induction over N, but my base case is called minus two. So is trunk minus two of some type A is going to just ask, be the type is contra A, so asking whether A is contractible. And then is trunk at a successor, I'm just going to write K plus one for successor because I think that's a little bit more readable. At A, it's going to say that for all X, Y type A, the identity types type A are truncated at the previous level. So this is the definition that uh, matches with this pattern. So is minus two trunk is another name for is contractible, is trunk minus two is the name for is contractible. So is truncated minus one is another name for is prop, which is just asking that its identity types are minus two truncated, is trunk zero, A is another name for is set, asking that its identity types are minus one truncated and so on. So that's how this goes. So, uh, right, so when uh, is trunk K A holds, we say that A is a K type. So uh, being, so we could say something as a minus one type, a zero type, a three type, et cetera, and so on. All right, so let's start proving some facts about this notion. And uh, in some sense, the most, or I think one of the most useful conceptually is the cumulativity of the truncation levels. So if A is a K type, uh, then A is also a K plus one type. Okay. So this is one of these proofs that I think goes a little bit better in a proof assistant, but I'm going to try and go slowly enough that we can, uh, that you might believe me even without a proof assistant. But if you don't believe me, uh, I suggest that you try and formalize this yourself. Um, and then, uh, you know, that's always a good strategy to try and convince yourself of something that seems unconvincing. So this proof is going to be by induction essentially all the facts that we're gonna prove about the truncation levels we prove by induction on K and T. So the base case, so the base case here I'm asserting that is trunk minus two A implies is trunk minus one A. But this you'll recall is asserting that A is contractible well, this is asserting that A is a proposition, and we've proven this already. So in our discussion of propositions, we observe that contractual types are always propositions. So that's the proof of the base case of this truncation level business. And that will be true for everything that I'm going to say about general truncation levels. We've already seen the base cases of these assertions. So that's always a good review. To think about how these statements would specialize to the low dimensions where it's maybe a little bit more familiar. All right, so now for the inductive step, I want to prove. So the inductive step is where my K is a successor. So this is my statement for a general K, but I'm gonna prove it in the case of a successor. So I want to prove that is trunk K plus one A implies is trunk K plus two A. And I get to assume an inducting my inductive hypothesis, which will be a term of type is trunk K A implies is trunk K plus one. Okay, so let's write out what we're trying to prove. So uh, this is trunk K plus one A, that is the type that uh, says for all x, y of type A, the identity type 
between x and y is k truncated. Whereas this type is trunk k plus two is saying that for all x, y type A, the identity type is k plus one truncated. Because I'm just spelling out the definitions here. But now, um, now that I've re-expressed the goal, I've sort of unpacked the goal, you can see that the inductive hypothesis is exactly what we mean. So this is another thing that feels kind of like a swindle, but it just works. Trust me. <laughs> you know, maybe, or maybe if you don't believe me, you could try to prove the sort of, you know, if, if, if an induction is confusing, it's always good to do a couple different base cases. So we've talked about the base base case, but you might, uh, apply this inductive step to prove the next base case, and then it, it might be a little bit more believable. But, uh, right, so again, to inhabit this type, I would give myself an X and Y, I would give myself a proof that the identity types are K truncated, I could imply the inductive hypothesis to conclude that that same identity type is K plus one truncated. Um, and then that's what I want. So this follows from the inductive hypothesis. Um, the inductive hypothesis. So that's pretty cool. Great. Okay. Um, so here's a corollary of this fact. So if uh, A is a K type, uh, then its identity types are also k types. Then its identity types are k types. So the way to think about this is that you know the notion of k type. I mean, it's defined by induction. So I'm speaking a little bit informally here. But the notion of k type, you know, for once you're above the base case, says that your identity types are k minus one types. But we've just seen that k minus one types are k types, and so that's um, that's what's being concluded here. The proof of this would be uh, by induction or uh, from the previous result, by induction and from the previous result. Okay, so a next thing to conclude, or a next thing that we can show, is that once more, uh, if I have a pair of equivalent types, if A is equivalent equivalent to B, then uh, if either of the types is truncated at some level, so if A is K truncated, then B is similarly K truncated. And our proof, sort of as before, so as before, so as when we showed the corresponding result for propositions, uh, we'll use an equivalence between A and B regarded as a function from A to B to prove that if B is the one that is K truncated, K truncated, then A is also K truncated. And the way that you would prove the other implication is by using the inverse equivalence. So, um, and this is going to be by induction on K and T. So the base case, again, is, uh, is the invariance of contractible types under equivalence of contractibility under equivalence. Great. And uh, so for the inductive step, so once more, our equivalence from A to B uh, provides an equivalence. So once I have an equivalence, the corresponding application function is an equivalence. And in the inductive step, so that's assuming that B is uh, K truncated. So if B, sorry, K plus one is K plus one truncated, 
its identity types are then K truncated. That's the definition. Its identity types are K truncated. So I'm in the process of showing that uh, truncation levels are invariant under equivalence, but this is one of these sort of delicate inductions where I can use exactly the inductive hypothesis that I have at exactly the stage to conclude exactly the thing that I want. Um, so by the inductive hypothesis, I'm trying to show something that's the invariance of uh, K plus one truncated types. So I can assume the invariance of K truncated types under equivalence by the inductive, can't really read that at all, inductive hypothesis. Uh, uh, it follows that uh, the corresponding identity types in A are K truncated, which is what we want to show, K truncated. Uh, which is what we want. Great. Okay, so one uh, more general fact about um, truncation levels, which I'm going to leave as an exercise, is to give some sort of similar argument that would show that if uh, F from A to B is an embedding, so rather than a equivalence, then uh, if uh, B is a uh, K plus one type, so is A. Uh, and there's something a little delicate here uh, to notice about the statement. Um, uh, I'm not asserting this, you know, uh, for K in T. So I'm not asserting this for all truncation levels. I'm asserting this for all truncation levels above the base because um, we've seen already that uh, propositions can embed into contractible types. In fact, that was a um, characterization of being a proposition is that this constant map gives an embedding into the constant type. Um, so it's so it's not the case at level minus two that embedding into a minus two type implies that you are a minus two type, but it is the case once you get above level minus two. So there's something a little bit delicate in the statement here, but um, uh, this I venture you would be able to prove at this stage. Okay, great. So um, so there's one last thing I want to discuss in. The last 10 minutes, which are the relative analogs of all of these notions. So um, maybe I'll do a transition. Um, so in the base case of this hierarchy for the contractible types, so in addition uh, to contractible types, we have something called contractible maps, which are better known by another name. Um, what is that name? So for the folks who are here, if you want to drop into the chat, what is an, another way of saying a contractible map? What does the name contractible map refer to? What have we proven about contractible maps? So in addition to contractible types, we have contractible maps. Maps, AKA. So there's a definition of contractible maps that I've seen in the chat. And there's a theorem about them, which I've seen now too, wonderful. So also known as equivalences. So the results that we've proven is that uh, for uh, a map between types, uh, the following are logically equivalent, are uh, logically equivalent. So the first statement is that F is an equivalence. And the second statement is that the fibers of F, so for all uh, terms B of type B, 
the fiber of F over B is contractible. So contractible maps, the definition is that they have contractible fibers, but it turns out that this is a way of characterizing the equivalences, which is a very useful family of maps. Um, so we're going to generalize this. This generalizes to higher levels, generalizes to higher levels. And once again, the sort of next step in this case of the generalization is uh, super interesting and important. So I'm going to spend most of my time here and I may have to leave uh, the full generalization to the exercises. Okay. So subtypes, uh, I'll just give a definition. Uh, so, so um, and actually this, the, the perspective is, is a little bit different than the one that I just previewed, but we'll, we'll get back there very soon. Um, so a type family, uh, B over A is a subtype uh, if for all terms x and x and a, the type b x is a proposition. So I've been informally using the term uh, predicate, but uh, it's also this is frequently described as being a property. So a, a type family. Uh, like this is uh, gives a property of X and A or a predicate on X and A. The point is it's uh, the intuition is it's giving some sort of truth value, but not any additional data because uh, what does proposition mean? Well, you know, one option is that B of X is empty. Another option is that B of X does have a term, but in that case, then B of X is contractible. So it would have a unique term if it does have a term. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a way to think about subtypes. Uh, I mean, the, the, the name subtype is a, is a little bit confusing. You know, why, <laughs> why are these called subtypes? Uh, I mean, I, I said something as a subtype and then I described it as type family. Why are these called subtypes? I mean, the thing that corresponds to the sub subtype is you can do the following construction with a type family. Uh, we can consider the dependent sum. So for an arbitrary type family, I can form this dependent sum. And then there's a comparison map down to this base type, which is called the first projection, PR1. And we will show, uh, we'll show that uh, B is a subtype of A, or is a, so the, the language is a little bit confusing, but B is a subtype uh, if and only if this map is an embedding, is an embedding. So that's the sense in which um, we think of this as being sort of a subtype. And a lot of uh, uh, definitions that we've been giving kind of all of, along are arranged so that this would be true. So for instance, uh, we defined this type of equivalences to be a sum over uh, f from a to b of this thing uh, sort of is a quiv, which was defined in various ways. And uh, for most of those definitions, maybe for all of them, we can't quite uh, yet show that these are propositions, though I promise this is coming very, very, very soon. But this is arranged. Uh, so that this first projection, um, I mean, the, the, the way that we form this type is so that this, the bit in here does not provide additional data. Um, so this is gonna be one of these sitting, settings where this is actually a subtype uh, modulo, uh, something to be discussed next time to be discussed next time. Okay, so our the last goal, I want to complete this proof that connects this definition of subtype to uh, this idea that this first projection from the sigma type is an embedding. And the way we're going to prove that is I'm going to 
prove a theorem that uh, appears to be more general, though really is essentially the same and is interesting in any case. So for uh, F from A to B, uh, the following are logically equivalent. Are logically equivalent. And uh, statement one is that F is an embedding. And statement two is that for all terms B of type B, the fiber of F over B is a proposition. And here, this theorem is the promised analog of the theorem that we've seen already contracting, connecting equivalences and contractible maps. So uh, the contractible maps, the sort of minus two truncated maps are the equivalences. What this theorem is saying is that the minus one truncated maps, those whose fibers are propositions are the embeddings. So equivalences and embeddings fit at the bottom levels of a corresponding hierarchy for maps that uh, you'll be able to read more about in Egbert's book. But let me prove this theorem for you and we'll conclude the corollary and then we'll wrap things up. So, okay. Um, so I wanna prove a logical equivalence between one and two. And yeah, I think this is, uh, I think this is pretty cool. So, uh, so let's just start with one. So um, by the fundamental theorem of identity types, So uh, F is an embedding, uh, sort of if and only if. So first I'll remind you of the definition of an embedding. It says for all X, Y, in A, I have an equivalence between the identity type in A and, uh, sorry, this equivalence is given by app F and then the corresponding identity type in B. And a way to think about this is this is one of these families of equivalences, and it's saying that this other type family could have, could have served as an alternate model of the identity types on A. So by the fundamental theorem of identity types, a way to prove that this other type family uh, models the identity types on A or is equivalent to the identity types on A is that this type here is contractible. So for all X and A, F of X equals F of Y, as an equivalence of type B uh, is contractible. Okay, but what is this? Uh, so this thing here is the fiber of the map F over the term F of Y. And so this is already giving a proof of one direction. So this proves, so the fundamental theorem of identity types proves that one implies Two, so having an embedding implies, uh, sorry, two implies one. It's one of the directions, not the other one. Um, so if all of my fibers are contractible, in particular, these fibers are contract, sorry, what am I talking about? Uh, I don't think I've quite proven any, either of the directions. I'm missing a little, uh, I'm missing something a little bit in both directions. Let me let me just keep going. So, um, right. So, I mean, this is close to the statement because I'm trying to prove, uh, I've got some characterization of the embeddings in terms of certain fibers. It's not quite all fibers and it mentions contractibility instead of being a proposition, but that's exactly, uh, th those two things are sort of off in exactly a parallel direction and that's gonna complete the equivalence. So, um, so if, uh, you know, I need to say something now about arbitrary fibers as opposed to just these particular fibers. So I'm gonna let B be an arbitrary term of type B. And uh, if I'm given a term P from F of Y to B, then uh, transporting gives an equivalence. Transport along P uh, gives an equivalence between uh, the fiber of F over the term Fy and the fiber of F over B. 
And so thus, uh, um, what I've shown is that F is an embedding if and only if these fibers are contractible once I have a B and once I have a P. So this latter condition is telling me that, uh, you know, having a term in the fiber implies the contractibility of the fiber of F. And so what this gives me is uh, a, um, a logical equivalence between, um, or sorry, what, what this is giving me is an equivalence between uh, this first hypothesis that I have an embedding and uh, this uh, second hypothesis that my fibers are propositions using the third equivalent form of being a proposition, which is that once those types are inhabited, then they are contractible. Okay, so um, I guess in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there, um, except I want to also mention this conclusion, which is that for any type family B over A, uh, the following are logically equivalent, are logically equivalent. So uh, firstly, I can say that this first projection is an embedding, which is our sort of intuitive way of thinking about a subtype that the total space of this type family embeds into the base space. And the second is that B of X is a proposition for each X in A. And the proof of this is this is really just a special case of the previous results because uh, B of X is equivalent to the fiber of the first projection map over X. And what we've proven is that for any map whatsoever, not necessarily a first projection, that map uh, is an embedding if and only if its fibers are propositions. Okay, so that's all we have for today. Um, thanks very much and I'll see you all on Friday. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, thank you so much. Are there any questions for Emily? Um, if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. So we have a question from Nelson in the Q and A. Um, they say that the this correspondence reminds them of how subobject classifiers in the topos give a correspondence between monomorphisms into something, kind of like being an embedding, and maps out of that something into the subobject classifier. Is there any connection here? Mm. Great. So uh, that's a great question. Um, so there's a lot more to say about, <laughs> there's a lot more to say about all of this. And I'm hoping that uh, some of this will come up in the colloquia at the end of the course. So, um, uh, so the uh, kind of high level perspective of the abstract structure provided um, by these uh, truncation levels and the corresponding notion of equivalence is uh, using something called a modality. Um, so, um, and there's lots of different perspectives on uh, modalities. So um, let's see. So, I mean, one thing to say is that um, we think of there, uh, uh, there's a, you can think of that the propositions, for instance, or the K truncated types for any truncation level K as assembling into a sub universe of the uh, universe of all types. Um, uh, and that subuniverse has uh, certain special properties that uh, I hope will be addressed in that lecture. And um, that, uh, I guess, means that it's sort of type theoretically well behaved. And, um, and, and, uh, and that's a kind of abstract way to understand that the analogy that you're thinking of. So, in kind of classical mathematics, we think of there as being uh, sort of two different propositions. There's the true proposition and the false proposition. 
you know, and these assemble into two elements of this sub-object classifier and the topos of sets, and that's kind of the universe of propositions there. So this is a much more uh, abstract way um, to think about all of that. Um, but there's a lot more here that's been uh, developed by Egbert and uh, various collaborators. And um, it's a wonderful question that I think we should uh, pursue somewhere else, so. Okay, is there um, one more question maybe? Um, if not, then we'll stop the recording now. Maybe.